Hello to everyone. I uh, can't see you all, but I'm, gosh, uh, both dreadfully impressed and not intimidated that so many of you have dialed in. So hopefully what we'll talk about over the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes will be of interest. And then we'll leave lots of time at the end for questions and chat. Um, and I'm happy to take questions through chat about what I talk about or, or really about anything, I, I, I don't mind. The reason I've chosen this topic for today, many of you will have heard this term about personalised medicine. It was really a term that took off in the area of oncology in particular, with the idea about trying to match your treatment better to you as an individual. And there was a strong focus on what that meant in terms of genetics in particular and choosing a treatment that genetically made sense for you. Really, personalising treatment in mental health to me means, yes, genetics, but an awful lot more than that. So what I want to talk about today is why we need to have good individualised treatment in the treatment of mood disorders and also what are the steps involved in that? And then as Jim said, uh, uh, it's not so much an individual, but unfortunately Victoria collective experience at the minute. If I get some time, we might briefly chat about COVID because it seems pretty hard to ignore that at the minute. I'll just start here with what has been the most recent version of our college's clinical practice guidelines for mood disorders. And, I had the pleasure of being one of a group of authors led by Jim Marley when this came out in 2015. And there's an updated version very close to publication later this year. Some of you may have had an opportunity to look at parts of this document. If not, it's freely available through the college website. And in a way, it represents, like all guidelines, hopefully, the very best efforts of a group of um, esteemed people and a couple of hangers on like me to bring together the currently available evidence and describe what should be the standard of care in the treatment of mood disorders. Now, of course, there's always going to be limits to how well you can do that. So there are many questions in the treatment of depression or bipolar disorder for which we don't have complete evidence-based answers. The studies just haven't been done. Particularly, for example, when you've already had a few treatments, we've got evidence about other treatments that might work for, say, treatment-resistant depression. But do we have really good studies that say the best third choice is A or B or C? And the short answer is, unfortunately, no, we don't really. Further, one of the things the guidelines stresses is that the time of its publication, we had very little data that helped us to decide what was the best treatment for Fred or for Rachel or for Assumpta depending what other things were happening in their life, who they were as a person, their culture, their racial origin, their views about treatment and their past experience. The guidelines emphasise how important they are, but a real and important practical question is, how does that translate into our current treatment? So for example, within the guidelines, some of you may have seen a slide of this before. It's kind of perhaps the best known um, diagram from those guidelines that talks about the steps in the treatment of major depression. Emphasises that for everyone, we should be aiming to get fully better, that there's a set of, uh, if we can call them non-specific things that we call step O around sleep, diet, exercise, and so on. Then we've got Step one, if required to move to psychosocial interventions, 
and either psychotherapy or pharmacotherapy, and then through the steps, depending upon your response. That sounds kind of relatively easy in some ways, doesn't it? But that diagram doesn't really include the sort of individual factors I mentioned before. Nor does our evidence. So some of you will also be aware of this big meta-analysis. It's a couple of years old now, but still the biggest and most recent one. Andreas Cipriani is a renowned psychiatrist now in the UK who does meta-analyses, pulling together all the studies, looking at a range of treatments in psychiatry, and on this occasion, looking at antidepressants. It's a massive study pulling together over 500 trials, comparing 20 antidepressants, including most of the ones we commonly use, and placebo in over 100,000 patients. It's very interesting the way they did this meta-analysis. Essentially, they made a decision that all studies are more or less comparable. So for example, if you compared fluoxetine to placebo in the treatment of depression, that's Prozac, and, and you separately in a different study compared the use of Zoloft, sertraline in the treatment of depression versus placebo, you could bring those two studies together and draw some conclusions about fluoxetine versus sertraline. Now there's some challenges in that, particularly when we look at studies involving older drugs like the tricyclic antidepressants that were done now 30 to 40 years ago, perhaps even slightly longer, some of them, where the design of the study was kind of different. But nevertheless, putting all this evidence together, what did they come up with? Some of you may be familiar at looking at this kind of diagram, but if I can get you to focus on the left-hand one for a minute. You can see down the bottom of the diagram, it's known as a forest plot. This is a comparison of all drugs versus placebo, combining these 500 studies. The dot represents the average of how well the drug did compared to placebo in terms of efficacy. That is getting people at least 50% better. We'd like it to be better than that still. If the ratio down the bottom was one, it would mean the drug was about as effective as placebo. Well, we wouldn't really want them there, would we? That wouldn't be very good. You can see that they're all to the right of that, which means in this big collection of trials, all of these available antidepressants were superior to placebo. Good thing. And they wouldn't have got licensed unless they were. And you can see there's a bit of a range in which was the most effective and which was the least. It's worth noting, of course, there's a whole lot of antidepressants that went through trials and didn't even make it to market who probably weren't better than placebo and therefore shouldn't make it to market. Interestingly, when I did a bit of media when this study first came out, one of the first questions I got asked, so Professor Hopwood, does this evidence surprise you that antidepressants work? To which my answer was no. I think we've known that for a long time. But this tells me nothing about which of these agents is most likely to work for an individual person in front of me. No way I can tell that. In fact, no way I can tell if the individual in front of me is going to respond to any of them. It would be incredibly valuable for me if I were able to say, based on your profile, any one of these drugs is the most likely to be effective for you. If you look on the right-hand side of this graphic, it's the same kind of a representation, a forest plot, but this one is looking at acceptability. 
it's measured by dropout rate in trials. How many patients had to stop the trial because they couldn't tolerate the side effect of the drugs. Here you can see the result is quite different to this big collection. So only a couple of drugs were statistically better than placebo in terms of side effects. And you might think, can that be possible? Um, it's an intriguing thing. When you, when you measure adverse events in a study, you'll include some things that do turn out to be side effects of the drug and other things that might actually be part of the underlying condition, like anxiety that can cause physical symptoms. If the drug is effective in treating the condition with relatively few side effects, it therefore might look better than placebo. And a couple do. Most don't. So the line that you can see through the dots represents our statistical confidence that the dot is a true result. And you can see for many of them, that line crosses the middle bar, which means we cannot say with confidence it's better than placebo in terms of dropouts. And there are a couple, and clomipramine in particular, that we can say is definitely not. We do have a fair bit of information about what are the most likely side effects with each of these drugs. So actually, this information does help me a little bit with individual care. And then I can start to look at what's most likely to be tolerated and perhaps which side effects are most likely with a given agent. And to be honest, our practice up until recently in choosing an antidepressant has been predominantly determined that way. Which side effects is this most likely to have and which ones are most likely to bother you? It's okay, but it's not great. And it does depend on us having that conversation. Why is that important? Some of you have seen me use this slide before. It's important because we know that actually most people don't take their antidepressants in the way our guidelines would say we like them to. So this graph is a study of about 90,000 Australians who were taking antidepressants that were fully subsidised, so money is not the issue. On the vertical axis is what percentage of people are still taking the drug, and on the horizontal axis is how many months they've been on it. Now our guidelines would say if you had an episode of depression and you found a drug at a given dose that worked, we'd recommend you stay on that drug in that dose for at least six to 12 months after you got better. In reality, the vast majority of people, 50%, had stopped the drug within three months and 40% within one month. That stopped picking it up from the chemist, by the way. That's the one thing we can reliably measure. Just because you pick up the script doesn't actually mean you're taking it. So here's a problem. Somewhere in there, there's a mismatch between what we know gives the best chance of treatment working in both treating depression and preventing relapse and what's actually happening. Is this just a medication problem? The answer is no. So if we look at adherence to psychotherapeutic treatment, and the easiest way to do that in Australia is look at data from the Better Access Scheme. So this is where, as many of you are aware, you have a number of sessions funded by Medicare to see a psychologist, predominantly other professions, but predominantly psychologists. We can look at the average number of times people attend under Better Access. Now, not everyone who goes to see a psychologist under better access has depression or anxiety, and certainly not all of them have bipolar disorder, but depression and anxiety would probably be the two commonest reasons. We're pretty confident about that. And all of our guidelines talk about structured therapies that probably involve somewhere between six and 10 sessions for most people. Clearly, if things are more complex, it's gonna take longer. The average number of times in most years people see a psychologist 
under better access is through. So it looks like a similar phenomenon might be happening. People take something, presumably most of them feel somewhat better or events move on and they drop out. That could be for a whole lot of reasons, including that our treatments are of course not perfect. But one of the possibilities we need to consider is this because we're not actually individualizing their treatment sufficiently. So how do we personalize our treatment? I think before we go into the science of it, I actually want to emphasize what I think at this point in our knowledge is far more important. The best way to personalize care, I'd argue for any mental health condition, is about a good assessment and a good relationship. So how can I personalize your assess your treatment if I don't really know who you are and what the important issues are for you? And as we'll come to in a minute, something about your preferences and choices. So time spent getting to know you and your circumstance and for you to get to know me is incredibly valuable. I have little doubt that if that's done effectively, the chance of reaching a good treatment relationship where things are likely to be done the way we'd like and a better chance of selecting the right treatment first is, a, is significantly high. I have no doubt whatsoever. And I don't envy the task, might I say, of many GPs who've got a relatively short time to do that before considering treatment options. I think that's pretty tough and challenging. So confidence based on a good assessment is irreplaceable in my view, and no science will trump that. Beyond that, there's also a process of reaching some agreement about what treatment might look like. Because I might have a whole set of ideas in my head about what I think treatment might look like, and the person I'm seeing might have a completely different set of ideas. And if they're completely discordant, the chances it's going to work out are not looking too good. That might start with a difference in the way we view what we're trying to achieve. So most of the trials we do, like those ones I reviewed earlier by Cipriani, we're looking at the classic symptoms of depression as measured by DSM or on a rating scale. And there's a whole set of questions that many of you will have been asked about things like mood, enjoyment, sleep, appetite, and so on. Whilst they are important, and that's what our treatments have been tested against, Zimmerman and others, and it's since been replicated in a number of parts of the world, actually said, well, just because we think that's important doesn't actually mean the patient sitting in front of me does. What do they think is most important in getting better? And these are in rank order. Number one, people said, I actually want to return to positive mental health optimism, self-confidence, which we sort of ask about, but not always in detail. We tend to ask more about negative mental health, low mood, pessimism, and so on. Number two, I want to feel like my normal self. It's an interesting question, definitionally, working out what that is sometimes. I want to get back to my usual level of functioning was the number three priority. And number four, I want to feel in emotional control. Number five, enjoy my relationships with family, friends, important others. Number six, getting rid of the symptoms. Not number one, number six. So if my treatments are based, my treatment sounds a bit like ownership, doesn't it? That the treatments we've got available are actually targeted at the sixth most important priority for you, we're already at risk. Now clearly these things are linked. So if we get rid of the symptoms of depression, is there a good chance you'll return to your usual level of functioning? Well, it's certainly going to help, isn't it? But equally, if treatments are good at getting rid of the negative symptoms of depression, if you like, 
Does that mean automatically that you'll get your optimism and self-confidence back? Actually, no, it doesn't. They do not necessarily vary together. So I need to recognise what's important to the person in front of me. Now, some doctors, when I talk to about this, say, well, look, you know, sure, but if I let the patient make the choice of treatment, is that a good idea? Where's that going to end up? Goodness me, total chaos. It's a terrible thing. Obviously, I don't think so. And this is a, a very interesting study from elsewhere in Asia that shows a very simple thing. So this study started out with a simple question. If you treat major depression that's mild to moderate, is it better to have psychotherapy or pharmacotherapy? It's a bit of an old question now. Nowadays, we'd say, why not both? You know, depending on the person's choice. Interestingly, 48% of people said they prefer talking therapy. Less than 20% said they prefer antidepressants. And about a third said, I don't know, I'm not sure. They were then randomised to receive one or the other. Not what they chose, just whichever way the coin landed, basically. At the end of the study, it showed that actually for mild to moderate depression, psychotherapy and antidepressants were pretty much equally effective. But then they did a secondary analysis where they looked at what if you got your preference or you didn't? And they showed that if you got your preference of treatment, you did better by a margin at the end of the study of about five points on the Hamilton rating scale for depression. And if any of you are familiar with the evidence, the average difference between an effective antidepressant and placebo is probably a bit less than five points. So getting your preference makes a difference, at least in this study. So part of getting your preference around, for example, antidepressants would be, what are your worries or what are your issues with starting an antidepressant? Let's talk about them. This is data from a survey um, uh, of patients presenting to a GP with either depression or current depression, asking them, if you're prepared to think about an antidepressant, and some weren't, what would your main concerns be? Particularly if we're going to say, we want you to take them for a number of months. For most people, it was about side effects. Interestingly, only less than 20% didn't believe they'd work. Now, there might be a subset of people who tried a few beforehand where they didn't work, I suspect, and quite rightly, they'd be sceptical, wouldn't they? The next most common reason is a fear of becoming dependent or addicted to it. Now, actually, those concerns are probably more relevant to some of the anti-anxiety medications that we've used in the past, you know, going way back, barbiturates and then benzodiazepines. A little bit less of an issue with the antidepressants per se. But if I don't address that in my conversation with someone who's worried about it, they might not believe me. People are worried about a quarter that medication will change my personality or make me a zombie. Or that I'll have the underlying fear that by taking it, I'll be sort of stigmatised for taking medication. A quarter of the people are worried about cost. Well, OK, fair enough. So in individualising treatment, here's a set of concerns that people often have some or several of. So straight away, I need to think, if I'm going to personalise treatment for you, I need to be asking about what you think about treatment and why. It's not to argue with you, it's to find out. Because if you've got a belief about treatment that clashes horribly with what I'm going to offer or recommend, then I'm probably silly recommending it. Because it... It's just not going to fit well. The kind of process I'm describing has been given the term shared decision making. There are other terms around and I don't want to diminish any of them. They're all describing degrees of a process 
where control moves from being solely in the hands of the treating doctor or clinician, right through to being solely in the hands of the person receiving treatment. And clearly a shift in that direction is entirely appropriate compared to some older models. People vary, in my experience, where they want to be on that axis. That's okay, but you should have the opportunity to at least express, these are the issues for me in treatment, have that discussed, and if ultimately you want to accept a recommendation, that's fine, but if not, let's hear it and have that discussion. So shared decision-making could be defined, and some of you can read this quicker than I'll say it. That definition, by the way, didn't come from mental health. It actually came from oncology. Really interesting that when I started in medicine, many of the cancer conditions were very stigmatised and had a real negative vibe around them. The treatments available at that time had an even more negative vibe and were highly stigmatised and people were very afraid of them, to be perfectly honest. There's been a very big shift in public attitudes towards oncology over the last few decades, not universally so, where it's moved to a much more sophisticated science and where there's a lot more open discussion about treatment choices. It's very interesting if you think about mental health, could some of the things I've said about oncology still apply in mental health? Absolutely. So can we learn something here? Absolutely. A shared decision making is essentially a two way exchange, initially of information. This can be supplemented by information prior to consultation. A lot of good information out there and one of the challenges of course is getting the right information sometimes, isn't it? Time to deliberate on that information and to come to an agreement about an option for treatment or set of options that is consistent with values, preferences, culture, etc., of the patient, not just the doctor. It's also an active process. So how you feel and think about what you want is likely to change over the course of time. So a good shared decision-making process is an active and dynamic one, not a static one in my view. Now, when you saw the talk was about individualised care and personalised medicine, some of you thought I was probably going to spend my whole time talking about this stuff, pharmacogenomics. The reason I haven't is because everything I've set up to this point is in my view, still more influential in getting you appropriate individual care than pharmacogenomics at this time. I'll explain what pharmacogenomics is, but I wanna put it in its appropriate place and priority. New science like this is very seductive and sometimes there's a hope, understandably, that it will answer everything for us. Whilst our current treatments are not perfect and not individualised the way we'd like, the process I've described up to this point that relates to their application can make a big difference to their likelihood of success. How much the new science can influence their likelihood of success still remains a debate. But let's talk about that debate. So pharmacogenomics is basically using the science of genetics to help us look at choice of medication. So all of the processes involved in us taking any medication, be it for mental health or anything else, are subject to a series of processes for which we have genetic variations. That can start with their absorption from the gut, their movement and binding through the body, their metabolism in the liver, 
in the case of drugs that we want to work in the brain, their passage into the brain. And then even at the very receptors, they work out in the brain or wherever they do target. And there may then be genetic variation in the proteins and other structures in the brain that binding to that receptor influences. So there may be a dozen or more different steps in a drug's action that are all subject to genetic variation. I kind of feel like in about a generation's time, maybe, by which time hopefully I'll have my feet well and truly up, that you'll be able to walk into my successor's office and they'll be able to test all of those 12 steps to help decide which drug, if that's the way we're going to go, will be the most useful for you. Maybe, just maybe, they'll even be able to look at genetic variations that might tell us which diet will be the most helpful for you in depression or which psychotherapy might be the most useful or which of any of those options might be the most useful. So I don't think we should see genetics as only influencing response to medication automatically. One of our current problems in development is we can't study all those steps. So most of the current development in this area has looked at genetic variation in drug metabolism in the liver. There's a set of enzymes, the cytochrome P450 systems that metabolize drugs and different systems metabolize different drugs more or less. And each of them is subject to gen genetic variation such that you might be someone who choose a particular drug up quickly or slowly. So if you're a fast metabolizer of a drug, you might need more of it to ensure that an adequate amount gets into your brain. If you're a slow metabolizer, you might need a lower dose or otherwise you're going to be more prone to side effects, for example. But it is only one step. So recently, we've started some work looking at other aspects of drug action in the body, including the transporters that carry drugs around your body, including some of those that influence a drug's ability to get through the so-called blood-brain barrier into the brain. Even some that might be relevant to their target receptors, although that's still a fair way from being fully developed. We've known for a long time that there are inter-ethnic and inter-individual differences in medication response. We've known, for example, in certain cultures, particular drugs are generally less well tolerated, and it's probably due to genetic variations in metabolism. We've also known for a long time that if you have family members who've responded to a particular drug, there is a slightly higher chance that you'll respond to it yourself, which sort of intuitively makes sense. And again, it's probably due to genetic variation in metabolism. There have now been a set of studies looking at various commercial developed kits to test these variations and use the information in predicting the most likely treatment. Chad Bousman and others recently did a big meta-analysis looking at the use of these tools in the treatment of adult major depression. And this included studies looking at the two tools that are most widely available in Australia. None of them, I should say, are rebated by Medicare, so they all remain quite expensive. They found a total of five randomised controlled trials so it's still pretty early days, with about 1,700 people in them. Basically, all of these studies were sponsored by manufacturers. And so there are some significant questions about the need for independent and larger study. What they showed is where individuals did receive 
pharmacogenetic guided antidepressant therapy compared to those who didn't, they're about 70% more likely to have a full response to the antidepressant they were given. Wow, that sounds very, very useful. If someone walked in and I could say, look, if I give you this test, there's a 70% chance the antidepressant we pick will be better for you than if we just did it by random. Wow. You'd, you'd buy that car. The authors looked at these trials looking for evidence of bias in who was recruited, how the studies were done, and so on. And they acknowledge that there are limits to that. And there clearly is a big need for independent large scale trials. If they went on to prove a result anything like this, you would strongly argue even these limited current genetic tests should become available. There are such studies of, uh, occurring now, including some sponsored here in Australia by our Medical Research Future Fund, and we await those results with interest. They may tell us the currently available tests are useful, and if they do, very good. If they don't, I don't think it means this is over. I think there will be a wait either way for more and more advanced genetic tools. And I'm pretty sure one day this will become a part of the standard of care. The key question is right now, should I be basing my care on this alone? And I think the answer is no. None of this is a supplement to any of the things I've previously described. And I don't think we can yet say with certainty that the results of this can determine with, with high level certainty a better outcome in treatment. It's still a watch this space, but an exciting space nevertheless. Now, as promised, I just thought I might close with a couple of comments about COVID. I know we're jumping ship, but it just seemed to me, if you're living in Victoria at the moment, going a whole hour without saying something about COVID just doesn't quite feel right anymore, does it? Unfortunately. Um, and I also realise there's a lot of interest in this topic in mental circles. Of them. To confirm COVID is a worldwide pandemic is true. And I think at a global level, we need to acknowledge as of July, and this is still true now, global numbers of cases are escalating. I think we quite rightly are a bit locally focused, and I'm sure like myself, everyone's been enjoying the fact that new cases in Victoria do finally seem to be coming down. I, I think we can now say that with confidence, even though they're still way above where we'd like it. Best wishes to anyone or their family who's been affected by it. But we need to acknowledge globally, this is still a huge health challenge. And we're closer, I think globally, to the beginning than the end, sadly, although a vaccine may change that, of course. Within mental health, there's been a lot of interest in a few specific aspects. One of them is what about COVID and the brain? Well, we're still waiting a lot of data, but this was a recent publication from The Lancet that pulled together the available data about so-called neuropsychiatric syndromes due to COVID. It also looked at past outbreaks of SARS and MERS, which thankfully didn't affect Australia anywhere near as much, and what was common after them. And they particularly looked, first of all, at people who'd been hospitalised. And actually the commonest things were confusion with delirium and the risk for some people of low oxygen when they were very unwell and potentially um, confusion and ongoing impairments due to that. The data wasn't great. It didn't seem to indicate that with COVID-19 though, there was a common different syndrome to that. 
So any, as some of you know, any severe viral infection can result in a delirium or confusion. And any severe cause of illness that lands you in ICU is at least in theory associated with the risk of low oxygen and subsequent injury to the brain. And that would appear if anything's going to happen with COVID in ICU, the commonest. These were people in ICU, I want to emphasise, not everyone with COVID. In fact, a tiny minority. What about as they got better? And for both MERS and SARS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome and SARS, they showed that rates of mood and anxiety symptoms post illness and in the next few weeks were incredibly common. With about a third of people cross-sectionally post MERS and SARS showing depressive and anxiety symptoms. Whereas if we cross-sectionally look at the whole population, we'd be looking at more rates of perhaps five to eight, maybe 10%. So a much higher incidence. And that's not terribly surprising. And it seems to persist for an extended time. The data for COVID isn't quite as clear yet. It's a bit about accumulation over time. But we do have, I'll just skip forward. No. Oh. We have some Australian data I'll show you in a moment that demonstrates it looks like that's true here as well. Why is that? Well, COVID-19 is a stressor at multiple levels, isn't it? It's not just about viruses and brains. It's a stress for the whole community. It's a general stress catching a viral illness and it can involve very traumatic events. It's a systemic illness, so we know that's associated with an increased risk. It might involve the brain, either directly or through inflammation. And some of the treatments required for those who are most ill with COVID-19 can be pretty toxic themselves. So there's a whole set of reasons that might predispose people to depression and anxiety. The most important of them for the community at large Probably isn't any of those though, and we'll come to that in a moment. Some of you might be aware there's been a bit of interest in a possible association of COVID-19 with stroke, particularly in older people. And I'm not gonna go through this in great detail in the interests of time, but just to say to you, it looks like this might be true. We see an increased risk of stroke, particularly in older people, with any viral outbreak, like flu every year. Kind of makes sense. But it looks like it might be higher with COVID. Again, much more likely in those who are severely ill and much more likely in those already at risk for stroke. But it's something we have to watch out for because it's clearly relevant to mental health. But what's relevant to most of us whether we've got COVID or not, it's actually being isolated. Brooks and others published a review of the impact of isolation. And what about isolation increased the risk? I think we have to accept isolation is part of our world at the minute. Hopefully it's going to decrease soon, but it seems a necessary thing. The commonest symptoms that isolation alone produced, as in quarantine, were symptoms for some of akin to post-traumatic stress disorder, confusion and anger. And these things were more likely, the longer you were in quarantine, the more anxious you were about infection, how poor supply was, and thankfully in Australia in many ways that's been better on most occasions, but I think we might be thinking about the quarantine hotel inquiry for a minute. How good your information is, your finances, and some of the stigma around infection that we can't underestimate. So in managing mental health, information is key. If we're gonna be in isolation, we need information. And, Look, opinions about this will vary, but I would be of the view that generally our governments have made 
pretty fair efforts to provide information during this time. We could debate that if you like. It needs to be up to date. Supplies need to be provided. And that's been a big debate. And quarantine should be as short as possible and generally voluntary. Involuntary quarantine seems to be associated with a greater mental health risk. Of course, the other big impact is economic recession. And I'm, I'm not going to talk this through because you know, I'm not an economist, but some of you have seen the publicity about predictions about the potential impact of economic recession on the mental health of Australians and elsewhere, including through high prevalence problems like depression. We've got good evidence over many periods of economic recession that it is associated with worse community mental health. And I don't think that's rocket science really, isn't it? So the advocacy for a set of measures around that to meet that need is in my view sensible and appropriate. How best to do that is always a topic for debate, isn't it? Um, and, and it doesn't always feel like we've got endless resources to bring to the table, but at least acknowledging this is an issue and sadly likely to remain an issue for a little while at least is really important in our response.